Everyone has a favourite childhood show. For some people it was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. For me, it was Conan the Adventurer. More than 20 years on, I decided to revisit the show. The story follows young barbarian Conan, who is on a quest to find a cure for his parents, turned to stone by the evil sorcerer Rathamon. With the help of psychics Zula, Jesmine, Grey Wolf and Snag, Conan defeats Rathamon and his plans to enslave the world. What began as a trip down memory lane led me into a fantasy cartoon world of camp arch enemies, deus ex machina plot devices and bad sound effects. My memories of the show were somewhat hazy, but I certainly didn't remember it being this bad. The rose-tinted glasses of my childhood had been forever shattered. Then I made the realisation it wasn't me, it was my idea of who Conan was that had changed. <sighs> Recently I'd stumbled upon the original Conan short stories. Reading them, I was taken by surprise. This stuff was actually really good. And the protagonist was a total badass. So just how had the book Conan become do-gooder cartoon Conan? For almost 40 years after the death of writer Robert E. Howard in 1936, the original Conan stories had been kept out of print, replaced by edited versions by a completely different writer. A man who would go on to exploit and betray the original source material. Without even knowing it, I had stumbled upon the trail of one of the greatest literary crimes of the 20th century. Conan! For most people, Conan begins and ends with the 1982 film of the same name. Starring Austrian bodybuilder Arnold Schwarzenegger, Conan the Barbarian was a smash hit that polarised critics. A perfect fantasy for the alienated pre-adolescent. Conan is a sort of psychopathic Star Wars, stupid and stupefying. One critic even described Schwarzenegger's portrayal as a dull clod with a sharp sword, a human collage of pectorals and latissimi. The film nevertheless went on to become a cult classic and was followed by the not-so-spectacular Conan the Destroyer. This film featured Conan punching a horse, Grace Jones in a G-string, and the worst ape suit to ever grace the silver screen. There were even plans to make a third film, but as far as the public was concerned, they had already made up their mind. This was not to be the last appearance of our half-naked hero, but nor was it the first. Before the films, there had been a comic book series. Before that, there had been novels. Before the novels, there were the original short stories. Created in the 1930s by Texan Pulp Fiction writer Robert E. Howard, Conan the Barbarian was first featured in the Weird Tales story, The Phoenix on the Sword. Born in 1906, the son of a travelling Texan doctor, Howard spent his childhood being dragged from place to place before his family finally settled in the town of Cross Plains. His only constant relationship up until then had been with his tubercular mother Hester, who instilled in Howard a love of books and poetry. From an early age, Howard displayed a vivid imagination. Forming friendships with some of the local kids, he began directing games of make-believe and exploring the countryside with his dog Patches. Howard's childhood, however, was not an easy one. His parents were rather controlling of his life, and as a result, he came to resent authority. Hating school, he channeled his energy into reading. Cross Plains didn't have a library, so Howard turned his attention to pulp magazines so called after the cheap paper they were printed on. At age 15, he picked up his first copy of pulp magazine, Adventure, and was at once hooked. Howard had decided early on that he wanted to be a writer. Seeing a window of opportunity, he began submitting stories to the pulps. Rejections piled up, but Howard kept at it, tailoring his writing to the market. Finally, three years later, at age 18, pulp magazine Weird Tales published the Howard short story, Spear and Fang. One bookkeeping course, several stories, and a couple of years later, Howard well and truly began breaking into a number of pulp markets. Then in 1932, after one of his frequent road trips around Texas, he came up with the character of Conan the Barbarian. His first Conan story, The Phoenix on the Sword, published by Weird Tales, proved a hit with the readers. They were soon clamouring for more, and over the next four years, Howard wrote 20 Conan stories. 
During this period, the health of Howard's tubercular mother Hester worsened. After a number of close calls, in 1936 she fell into a coma from which she would never wake. Then, at age 30, at the height of his success, Robert E. Howard walked out to his car and shot himself in the head. Howard's decision is one that still defies simple explanation. Yet the timing of that very decision would have consequences for his literary legacy. While Conan would go on to reach new heights of popularity, Howard became the subject of criticism and speculation. Howard was neither the first or last writer in history to commit suicide. In fact, he was in the company of such literary giants as Ernest Hemingway, Virginia Woolf, John Kennedy Toole, Hunter S. Thompson, Jack London, Edgar Allan Poe, and Raymond Chandler. Despite this, Howard's act has often become the focus of discussion about both his life and his stories. It all began with an American science fiction writer called L. Sprague de Camp. After Howard's death, the manager of his estate asked this writer to edit some Conan stories for publication. DeCamp then went on to convert a number of Howard's unsold and unrelated stories to Conan tales. His method was simple, change character names and replace guns with swords. Afterwards, DeCamp filed copyrights for those he had edited and any he'd adapted. To cement his claim to the copyright, he launched a lawsuit against the very publisher that had first hired him. Once the dust had settled, DeCamp began revising existing edits and writing entirely new pastiche novels with other writers. His reason was simple. Howard's works suffered from careless haste. His barbarian heroes are overgrown juvenile delinquents. His settings are a riot of anachronisms and his plots overwork the long arm of coincidence. By creating new Conan stories, DeCamp was able to bolster his own career and make a buck. But he wasn't happy just profiting from Howard's legacy, he also wanted to undermine his reputation. Drawing upon hearsay, speculation and psychobabble, he wrote a series of biographical studies painting Howard as a neurotic who suffered from Oedipian devotion to his mother and through a big and powerful man like his heroes from delusions of persecution. DeCamp at the time was considered to be the leading expert on Howard and Conan, so this caricature stuck. Things snowballed. DeCamp's accusations became an out-of-control game of Chinese whispers. He was convinced that the town wanted to exterminate him and Wrong. he'd go home and board up his windows, load rifles, and a complete nut. And Conan tells him, just stay there and write. And if you don't do exactly what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to cleave you down the middle. Wrong. Thus the myth was perpetuated and the damage done. A shadow had been cast upon Howard and his legacy, and in the coming years, it would only grow. DeCamp modified Howard's works in the belief he was improving them. Many fans disagreed. DeCamp is guilty as charged. Guilty of rape against Howard's work and committing grave violence against the artist's good name. The thorny issue was that DeCamp treated his own edits as the official version while blocking publication of the original manuscripts. The pastiche novels were just icing on the cake. According to DeCamp, they were written to strengthen his status as the Conan copyright holder. These novels, however, presented a very different interpretation of Conan and Howard's story world. It's been argued that these books kept Howard's fiction alive after his death, but it's also been argued that DeCamp was merely riding on the shirt tails of a brilliant writer. But was what he did really all that bad? To put this into perspective, imagine that Raymond Chandler had been written off as insane for taking his own life. Imagine that his Philip Marlowe detective series was kept out of print simply because one writer had deemed them inferior. Imagine that this writer published only edited versions and claimed copyright of the characters. Knowing the worth of Chandler and his work today, it's easy to think that this would never happen. But in Howard's case, it did. For a long time, Howard has been just a blip on the radar of literati, a pulp fiction writer of little consequence. His works went out of print shortly after his death. DeCamp managed to renew Conan's legacy by getting them back into print, but he also did plenty to undermine it. And as Howard and Conan's fan base grew, so too did the questions about DeCamp's methods and motives. One of the first fans to speak out was Don Heron. Heron pointed out that DeCamp's meddling had done more damage to Howard's fiction than good. 
he coined the term Conantics to describe the imitation works. Antics. Conan's actions have become nothing more than antics. Con. These stories are anti Howard. Tick. They suck the blood from the original tales. One of the fan community's key gripes was how the Conan character was depicted. Thanks to DeCamp, Howard's instinctual, murderous barbarian had been transformed into a cerebral, stock standard superhero. DeCamp's licensing of Conan to Marvel Comics played a big role here. Marvel was a member of the Comics Code, introduced to protect young people against the potentially corrupting influence of comics. The Code imposed a number of bizarre requirements. Good must always triumph over evil. Lurid, unsavory, gruesome illustrations are forbidden. Vampires, ghouls, and werewolves are banned. Love stories must always emphasize the sanctity of marriage. Marvel, as a result, was forced to present Conan as a positive role model. And in this modern visual age, it was this version of Conan that stuck. Then there were the films. <laughs> Conan the Barbarian arguably was the death blow to Howard's Conan. Director John Milius went the route of the pastiches, replacing Howard's version of Conan with something altogether different. I remember days like this, when my father took me into the forest and we ate wild blueberries. The sequel, Conan the Destroyer, really was a case of flogging a dead horse. The producers now decided to make Conan the butt of the joke. Conan! There are six of them against him. One, two, three. I think you're right. Meanwhile, frustrations within the fan community were at last reaching a boiling point. Many fans began openly petitioning DeCamp to publish the original stories. DeCamp only turned a deaf ear to them. The community soldiered on, building a thriving Howard and Conan scholarship and meeting annually to celebrate the author in his hometown of Cross Plains, Texas. DeCamp eventually withdrew from the scene and died. The Conan copyrights changed hands twice, but Howard's original stories remained out of print. Then, finally, in the year 2000, for the first time in 70 years, they were back in print. It was a victory for fans the world over. Some things, however, hadn't changed. But let's take a moment to rewind. <laughs> Knowing what I know now, it's hard not to see the Conan the Adventurer cartoon as just another bastardization of Howard's stories. Yet for me and thousands of other kids, it was Conan the Adventurer that first introduced us to sword and sorcery fantasy, a subgenre that Howard has been credited with single-handedly creating. His legacy can still be felt from cartoons like He-Man, to role-playing video games like Skyrim, to epics like Game of Thrones. Many of you have probably already written off Robert E. Howard as a crazy, and ruled Conan out as wish fulfillment for nerds. But let's not forget, for a long time, fantasy fiction was a pop cultural underdog. Then there was Game of Thrones, a landmark TV series that changed minds and drew in audiences like never before. With Game of Thrones, people at last understood that fantasy could be more than just escapism, that it could explore sophisticated themes, could introduce us to compelling characters, and could take viewers places they had never been before. So to all the doubters, let me say this. Read the stories of Robert E. Howard, see where modern mythmaking first began, and experience the real Conan for yourself, before the next film comes out. Wait. They're making another film? <laughs>